The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Terry Gaspard, who is a therapist, author, and college instructor. Terry's research studies have been published in the Journal of Divorce and Remarriage. And today, we're discussing her book, Daughters of Divorce, which has just won the Best Book Award for 2016 for Self-Help Relationships. So, Terry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rebecca. So good to be here. So, um, what made you interested in the topic of Daughters of Divorce? I am a daughter of divorce, meaning I was raised in a divorced home. My parents divorced when I was seven. And even though I had three sisters and I studied psychology and social work, I never felt that I had enough information about how my parents' divorce impacted me. A lot of the information that's out there focuses more on children, and I felt that my parents' divorce affected me even into young adulthood in terms of my relationship choices and how I felt about commitment, trust issues, and so on. So that's where I started my journey. And when I was in graduate school, I did research on the long-term effects of divorce and actually found out there were differences between how parental divorce affected men and women, so that got got me interested in focusing just on daughters of divorce. So how are, are, are women affected differently than men? Well, as women, we tend to define ourselves more through relationships, and we also identify more so with our mothers if we're raised by a mom and a dad. So when parents split up, often we take the divorce kind of hard. In most cases, girls tend to live or spend more time with their mom after the divorce as well. So the father-daughter relationship is impacted more so, and we can talk about that in a few minutes. So we tend to emotionally, socially, psychologically, you know, feel more wounded by the divorce. And also there's some new research which was published in a book called The Female Brain that says that men and women have different amygdalas. That's a part of our brain where we experience emotions. And because of that, we tend to hold on to emotional memories, both positive and negative. So women have a a, a little more difficulty with some of the emotional effects of parental divorce. We don't do poorly in other areas so much. We tend to be, you know, really strong more so with careers and other relationships, but sometimes we hold on to the um, the emotional effects of our parents' divorce. Well, you know, um, having gone through a, a parental divorce at a very young age, I found a lot of insight in your book. Um, I, th- I think that, you know, you were uh, pretty spot on, um, you know, even if everything... Obviously, situations are different and relationships are different, but there seemed, it seemed to bring a lot of insight to me. Thank you. I'm glad the book was helpful. It's helped so many people. It's, it's really a pleasure to get the word out there because as women, I think we tend to act like everything's okay and, you know, we rise above things. We try to be resilient because we focus, you know, more on other people. But this is a book that really helps women, kind of like a guidebook to help us see that if we do have some of the issues that are outlined in the books, this is such as trust issues or self-esteem issues, that there still is hope 
there, there are a lot of strategies in the book that can help young women and even women into middle age move beyond some of, you know, some of the uh, shadows of the past or the issues that, you know, may, may have, you know, impacted them and give them a sense of uh, hope for their future. So you, you just mentioned that self-esteems are affected and, and how, how does that, how does that happen? Well, I think often we take things hard and sometimes girls feel like they may have either done something to cause the divorce or in some ways, you know, feel like they couldn't do anything to stop their parents from breaking up. I know I felt that way. I wanted to fix the situation. I wanted to make my parents happier. I wanted them to stay together. A lot of times girls have a very strong need to keep, you know, keep their parents together and for everyone to be close. And so sometimes we can take it hard and feel that we're not worthy of having the loving, long-lasting relationships that our parents weren't able to attain. And that can affect not so much our careers, as I said, or other relationships, but it can, in fact, impact how we feel in romantic relationships. So sometimes we settle for less than we deserve. I know that certainly was true for me and many other women. And we might stay with a partner that's not right for us too long or pick someone who maybe we're incompatible with. or It's almost like it's a weird kind of mix, Rebecca. It's almost like... I'll stay with this person even though I know they're not right for me or I won't try for a relationship that would be a good match for me because, you know, I'm not really capable or feeling worth the kind of relationship that would be wonderful. And I've talked to so many young women that have done that. They've stayed in relationships for five, ten or more years where they were just settling instead of really thriving. Well, you know, I, I wonder if part of that, too, is not being aware that the relationship could be better. True, yeah, because they didn't have good role models. Yeah. That's a really important point. If you had relationships, you know, you had parents who had relationships that didn't work out, either you were very young like we were, or you were in adolescence when your parents broke up, any, any age, you know, and you, you didn't see parents that got along well, because let's face it, Parents typically have a lot of conflict before the divorce and after. You don't really have a good, you know, outlook and a good template for how couples should relate. So if you're arguing a lot with your boyfriend or your partner, you're, you know, maybe living together and you're wondering, you know, is this the way it should be? You don't really, you know, kind of like have a guideline for what's normal or what people, as you said, should expect. So sometimes it takes a while and some counseling or, you know, reading or blogging to figure out this isn't the way it should be. A relationship should really bring out our best. Yeah, I agree. Um, In your book, you talk about the sleeper effect. What's that? That's a delayed emotional reaction that was first outlined by a famous researcher whose name is Judith Wallerstein. She's um, now deceased, but she's written. She was one of the premier premier researchers in divorce, starting about fifty or so years ago. And she noticed in a lot of the women that she interviewed, and she followed some of the same families for up to twenty five years or so, that girls tend to act like everything's okay when their parents first split up or when they're young. And then during adolescence or young adulthood, they start feeling more the emotional effects of it, wanting to go back into the past and ask a lot of questions and kind of revisit their parents' divorce. So she dubbed it the sleeper effect because it's that delayed reaction And for whatever reason, guys don't tend to have that same tendency. They don't have as much of a need to go back and revisit their parents' divorce. Um, They're able, better able, as I said, because of their amygdalas and their brain development and also socially and emotionally to kind of let it go. 
but we have a need often to go back. My own daughter, Tracy, who I wrote the book with, actually went through that herself, and that was one of the main reasons I wrote the book, because she started asking me a lot of questions when she was in college about my own divorce, and then I realized, oh, my God, I did the same thing with my mom. So it's, it's sort of generational, and it's quite common, and the sleeper effect is... An unusual phenomenon, but a lot of the women I've interviewed, and I've interviewed hundreds, have spoken about that. Um, so how, how does being divorced affect a relationship? Being the daughter of divorce, I guess, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I, some of the things that I've already pointed out is sometimes we settle for less than we deserve. Sometimes we're fearful of commitment. And we worry that we're going to repeat the past. So you could be a person, I know I've been like this at times, where you have one foot out the door, you know, because you're waiting, for, you know, you're waiting for something bad to happen. So you might make a commitment, but it wouldn't be, or I might say, oh, sure, you know, I'm, I'm in love, I want to get engaged, but you're waiting for something bad to happen for the other shoe to drop. So it's not a full-fledged commitment. So a lot of the chapters in the book refer to that as a sort of a pessimistic view of love and marriage. Okay. And you're not sure why, because you think, well, you know, a, a loving relationship, marriage, all that should should bring you a lot of happiness. So you kind of stop short of that and question. You become kind of a little bit cynical. So that's a common reaction that that young women tend to have. And then the other one is when you're in a relationship, even after you get married, if you have conflicts, which all couples do, you worry that you're going to, you know, end up getting split up rather than staying with it and trying to work through some of the conflicts. Not all conflicts in marriage can be worked through. The famous researcher John Gottman of the Gottman Institute says only about 69% of conflicts, Rebecca, can really be worked through in a marriage. But I know myself and many of the women I've interviewed worry every time they have a disagreement or if the disagreements continue, this means my relationship is automatically doomed to fail. So it's, it's kind of a pessimistic attitude as opposed to seeing all couples have issues, assuming you pick someone who you're pretty compatible with, making a determined effort to stay with a relationship if you're fairly happy most of the time is important for our long-term happiness because all the research studies pretty much show that when we're married, in a happy marriage that is, we tend to be healthier and live longer lives. So when, when we're... Um you know, affected by this, how is our trust of others affected? Well, we tend to mistrust because we had a feeling when we were young, especially if we were very young when our parents divorced, we had a feeling of not being able to trust that relationships were going to last. And sometimes we couldn't trust our parents if they left suddenly. In my case, it was my mother who actually left. So you might wonder, is that person going to be there for you? Are they always going to, you know, have your best interests at heart? Some of that could be projected onto partners. So you need to realize some of it is your past. So assuming you pick someone who's trustworthy, of course, that's always important, Rebecca, as we know. We want to pick someone we can, you know, count on and someone who has consistency between their words and their actions. But if we pick someone who's trustworthy and we still question and have a lot of doubts about them, then it's time, I think, to really examine ourselves and to see if we have some unresolved trust issues from our past. And if that's true, if we do have them, which I've dealt with a lot in my life, I have found counseling to be very beneficial. A lot of women come to see me for that reason. And you can develop trust over time. It is a skill. It's not something that's a, you know, magic. It's something that if you work on it, 
and you learn to trust yourself and be a better judge of, you know, okay, this is my own issue versus projecting your mistrust onto someone else, and you give people a chance and extend trust to people that are trustworthy, you can, you can stop overreacting. And sometimes, for instance, a trust issue may mean just, you know, issuing an ultimatum and being very, very um, kind of harsh towards someone when they make a mistake. Because all people make mistakes. But when you have trust issues, um, you might attribute a small error in judgment as being intentional, if you're following me. Mm-hmm. So you have to learn to trust others very gradually, and over time, you can become a, a more trusting person. Um, well, that sounds pretty hopeful. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've helped a lot of people work through. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. Today we're talking with Terry Gaspard. She is the author of Daughters of Divorce. Um, so please tune in and we're going to be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. We are bombarded with information daily about happy life strategies, beauty products, and business success ideas. Are they truly going to make a change or just take the change out of your pocket? Tune in to Shelly's Show and Tell with host Shelly Hancock. Shelly will explore and recommend proven business ideas as well as show you how to use the law of attraction to create health, happiness, and a prosperous business. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events page is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Today, we're talking with Terry Gaspard. She's the author of Daughters of Divorce. So, Terry, when we're we're talking about this whole process, of course, we're talking about relationships and and marriage. And and I think, um, you know, first, we should talk about what people are actually expecting from a marriage. Well, that's a good point. I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, have unrealistic expectations. And in the past, you know, relationships and marriage were a lot about working together, you know, for children, and they weren't as much about personal growth and happiness. But I think most of us today in the 21st century, we want it all. You know, many of us want, want a family, but primarily we want to find a soulmate and someone we're compatible with and, and who we can really enjoy life with. 
So I think picking a partner that we have, in my opinion, that we have compatibility with in terms of interests and, you know, values, all the things that we want out of life, but also someone that we have chemistry with, which can be physical but also intellectual, is really important. What do you think? I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, if you don't have much in common, you're you're not going to have anything that brings you together. Definitely. Because, you know, when you spend you end up spending all your free time when you're not working with your friends, other people or isolated and you don't really enjoy spending time with your partner, that can also lead to divorce. So I think taking your time and really finding out what you value and what's important to you, waiting till you're in your late 20s if possible, and a lot of people are doing that now, and picking a partner who is a really good match for you can help you find long-lasting love. Oh, okay. That's nice to hear. <laughs> um, I know in, in your book you did talk about finding someone in, in your late 20s, but also um, that, you know, you should be with them for a couple of years. Um, is there anything else that people should should do so that they make sure that they pick the right partner? Yes, I think it's really important to get to know their family and to... Look for red flags. For instance, are they, you know, inviting you to spend time with their family and friends? Do they value value your relationship with your friends and family? You know, do they take the time to listen to you and really ask about your day and what's important to you? You know, a lot of times we see red flags, I think, as women, and we tend to overlook them because we want to gloss over things. But those things that may crop up while you're dating someone or living with them that are unresolved or not really taken seriously can become bigger issues after you get married. So taking your time and taking things slowly because many people rush into making a commitment is important, but also... Pay attention to those red flags, and if they they really make you uncomfortable, maybe the relationship isn't right for you. And don't be afraid of being alone. And make a stand, and may you know maybe even break off or you know end a relationship that isn't the right one for you. So when when we're looking at all of this, you said revisit your family and your relationships. Is there a way that that we can look at our parents' divorce and how that affected us, and and can that help us to do that? I think so. I mean, in my case, I have really gotten to the point where I advise people to be careful not to pick a partner who's a lot like the parent that, you know, left or you had a lot of struggles with or observed the, you know, the parent who was, you know, the one who maybe was, you know, the instigator of the divorce or who was more difficult. Try to find a partner who you're you're compatible with and learn from those patterns of your past. You don't want to recreate them. There's a, a psychologist, I don't know if you've heard of him, Harville Hendricks, Yep. And he wrote a book called Getting the Love You Want. And he talked about the imago, which is the image that we all have from our childhood. And sometimes it can be a combination of more than one parent. I didn't realize, and many people don't, that we follow those patterns so closely because we're not aware of them. So if you, if you are dating someone or living with them and you, and they're so familiar and they bring up a lot of trust issues or they make you feel at times uncomfortable or unsettled, pay attention to that. Because you may be recreating your, you know, your parents' marriage and then, and then subsequent divorce without even realizing it. So, um, um, how do we, go about revisiting this so it means sometimes we don't realize it I know in your book you had some uh, questionnaires and and I can Uh imagine it's really difficult to see that in yourself I mean sometimes we have to go through our own our own trials to actually come out in the end to see that 
that we're, you know, replaying some of those past experiences? Well, I put the questionnaire in the book because that's the questionnaire that I passed out, the survey that I passed out to the women in the study. And I recommend everyone try to answer those questions. And like I said, therapy can be very beneficial or certainly at least visiting um, your parents, spending time kind of processing things. And one of the primary reasons for that, Rebecca, is your take on your parents' divorce when you were a child is going to be very different than when you're an adult because your view of life has changed so much. So that's where revisiting their divorce from an adult perspective is very helpful, helpful because you may find out things by talking to them or even other family members that you didn't really understand when you were a child. Um, And then, you know, sitting down with one or both of your parents is a very good thing to talk about, you know, the reasons they got the divorce because you may have misunderstood things. You may have some unresolved questions. And that's a healthy thing because that can help you prevent you uh, rather from recreating a similar type relationship in your own life. Just gaining a more mature, realistic perspective is a process, and my book can help you do that. Um, There are a couple of other books on the market um, that can, you know, I think one other one, Overcoming Your Parents' Divorce. So, you know, going back and revisiting the past is, is a positive thing. It doesn't have to be all negative. It can actually give you, as you said, when you read the book, some some good insights. Um, So when we're going about this journey, how is forgiveness part of this? Well, for one thing, I recommend that we try to approach our parents' decision to divorce a little more objectively. It is important to realize that parents typically don't understand that divorce is harder on children than it is on them. I spent a lot of time educating through blogging and coaching and counseling on that topic because parents are not, for the most part, aware that divorce is really painful for kids. So I think that it's important to forgive your parents and to understand that, for the most part, they didn't make the decision Lately, they probably did think about it quite a bit, and yet they, you know, were not trying to hurt you. They were not trying to be, you know, um, harmful in their actions, even if they were unfaithful or had, you know, some, some of those betrayal issues going on. So I think trying to forgive your parents, even if one of them did instigate the divorce or was you know, unfaithful is really important. Trying to heal, trying to, you know, let go of what I refer to in the book as a grievance story, which is a negative story that we tend to carry around about our parents' divorce, will help you move on and have healthier relationships. So what can a grievance story look like? A grievance story might be, well, my my parents didn't really love... The other one, they didn't care enough about, you know, the family when they were young. They're selfish. Maybe they fell in love with someone else. They went ahead and had another family. And it's it's very negative, pessimistic view, as opposed to they made some mistakes. They weren't perfect, but in spite of their flaws... They probably did love the other, you know, my other parent when they got married. And maybe they made some bad decisions along the way, but that doesn't mean that they didn't, you know, love or care about me. So do you see the difference between those two? Yes, definitely. One is very pessimistic. It's very unforgiving, very much holding a grudge. And the other one is more accepting. And I do think that if forgiveness is hard for you or anyone, because it is a tough one when, you know, when we've had bad things happen, 
then we can try try to have at least more accepting views of what happened, and that can that can kind of free us up and help us, you know, just feel better about the future, more hopeful. So, so you mentioned um, earlier about the the daughter's relationship with her father, and and what does that have to do with all of this? Well, typically, and it's not always the case, and it wasn't in my family, but typically it is true that the dads are the ones that instigate the divorce and or don't spend as much time with their daughters. Only about 10 to 15% of dads have regular, close to equal contact with their daughters after the divorce. So because of that, there's often a wound in that relationship, and Many times dads will contact me and daughters, but I get a lot of phone calls from dads, Rebecca, saying they want to go back, they want to heal the relationship, but they don't know how. And so that really requires some concentrated effort. I also have daughters who say they don't really see their dad on a regular basis or maybe their dad's remarried, they don't know, you know, what the best thing to do in terms of contacting them. So I have a lot of suggestions in the book, um, but the father-daughter relationship can be really a template because a lot of times when we're growing up, we get our views about men and what to expect from relationships from observing our dads. So if we had a dad we were close to, that can help us in many ways to feel, you know, that's what pretty much I can expect. Um, And sometimes girls feel really close to their dads when they're young, and then if they don't have a lot of um, contact with them, it can affect your self-esteem. So there's a lot of aspects to that father-daughter relationship. Many of the women that I interviewed that did really well after their parents' divorce did continue to have regular contact with their dad. So that's one one of the reasons why I write a lot and lecture a lot about co-parenting in a healthy way. Um, That's becoming more common where parents will share or have, you know, kind of close to equal contact with their kids. So I think our society is changing and we're realizing that divorces do happen and if as much as possible dads need hopefully we'll have a lot of regular contact with both of their kids, you know, after divorce, but it can have a profound effect on the father-daughter relationship if they don't. So you talk in your book about, um, well, and you just mentioned uh, fathers being absent. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, that's not always that that they're not there. there. Is there other ways that a father can be unavailable as well? Well, exactly, because... They don't always know how to connect with their daughters. And I find a lot of dads especially discuss the difficulty with this when their daughters are teenagers. They don't don't really know what to do with them, how to spend time with them. One dad called me and he was coaching with me about how he could get closer to his daughter when she was with him on the weekends, Rebecca. And I suggested that he he spends some time doing some of the things that she liked to do. And he said, well, that's hard because she likes to go shopping a lot. (laughs) So I said, well, maybe you could try a little shopping. Try, you know, try to maybe she'll be interested in watching sports with you or doing some of the things you want to do. Just trying to find that common ground with your daughter, which isn't always easy. But um, sometimes letters are really beneficial, too, if you don't see your daughter a lot. I've recommended a lot of dads and daughters, but but especially dads who don't maybe know how to communicate as well over the phone or, you know, through text messaging, write a letter and and share some of their feelings with their daughter. And those can be helpful. But the relationship can be tricky, as I said, especially during adolescence. I think it's tricky even if you're not divorced from what I hear. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, it's tricky time because, you know, girls yeah. are, are growing up fast, but they're also really, uh, you know, um, self-conscious. They want to be with their friends. They can push both of their parents away. 
but especially after divorce, it gets complicated if you don't see both of your parents on a daily basis. I know what it was for me because I went a long time without seeing my dad at times because after my, my mom left, but then she came back and I was back and forth a lot. But I ended up reconnecting with my dad really well um, as a young adult, and I think that was very helpful for me, and I think it can be very beneficial for our daughters to do that, if possible. Not all, not all relationships can be healed. Sometimes women have told me that they had no interest. You know, and, I, and I'm, I'm certainly not in favor of, you know, pushing someone beyond their limits. But talking about forgiveness and healing that relationship kind of, kind of can free both dads and daughters up to at least envision it as a possibility. Well, and like you said before, the you know the the grievance story or the perception as a child could be different than what actually happened. So it seems like it's important to also revisit and see if if the issues in the relationship are. Um, I, I, I want to say real, but I don't think that's the right word because I think it, it it's always real. But right. um, you know that it can be changed, and the perspective on it can be changed. Definitely. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, One of the women I interviewed, her father left on Christmas Day and didn't have a lot of contact with her. And her mother actually was an alcoholic. And she felt very angry towards her dad because her dad remarried and had several other children. And she was feeling very burdened by her mother's alcoholism. And she blamed her dad for a lot of that, Rebecca. And then as an older teenager, young adult, right, you know, in college age, she went and started spending time with her dad again and heard his side of the story and realized that her father never even knew that her mother had become an alcoholic. And her mother had told the dad that she didn't want to spend time with him. Mm. So he didn't really know how how to go about instigating or, you know, kind of encouraging a relationship with his daughter. But when they reunited years later, because she was about seven or eight when her dad left, she realized that they still loved each other. There was a bond there, and they were able to reunite in a really positive way. So there, there was a perfect example about her perceptions of why her dad wasn't in touch were very different from the facts. Yeah, so, you so know, I mean, so I'm not saying everybody's situation is that, you know, exact scenario. Yeah. But getting yeah. more information can be very healing. Um, it, it definitely sounds like it. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Terry Gaspard. She's the author of Daughters of Divorce. We're going to be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Frankly Speaking About Cancer is a program designed to empower survivors and their caregivers to deal with the social and emotional challenges of cancer. The show will invite physicians, researchers, nurses, social workers, patients, and caregivers to share their advice on how to live a better life with cancer. Join host Kim Tibaldo, President and CEO of the Cancer Support Community, Tuesday afternoons at 1 p.m. Pacific Time and 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Network. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of Return to Peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually, as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific, on Voice America Health & Wellness. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN. 
or follow along with us at Voice America TRN, the Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Today, we're talking with Terry Gaspard. She's the author of Daughters of Divorce. Um, This book actually just recently won the Best Book Award for 2016 in the self-help relationship category. So, Terry, um, when we're talking about, um, you know, this whole process in your book, you have a lot of um, information to help people to repair um, some of, I guess we can say, damage or some of the things that have happened. And um, how one of the first things we talked about was that self-esteem can get affected. And how can we go about to, to repair that? Well, I think be, self-awareness is always the first step. And realizing that if our self-esteem isn't consistently pretty good, that may be from our primary relationships with significant others in our lives. It was a tricky issue when Tracy and I were researching it because we realized that your self-esteem doesn't always, you know, look consistent in all aspects of your life. In other words, in my case, I had a good... Um, sense of self-worth in terms of my career and friendships, but not in romantic relationships. So you've kind of, you have to look at the whole picture. But what you can do is you can make a decision to look at your self-esteem and to do things for yourself every day to set some basic goals. And you can either through, you know, journaling or through different means you can keep track and improve your self-esteem through a variety of different manners such as reading, blogging, counseling. Groups, either online or in person, can be very beneficial for your self-esteem as well. So what what does a healthy self-esteem look like? Well, you basically value yourself in a positive way and you... Don't put yourself last. You know, you you consider your needs, and your needs are varied from day to day. So, you know, you don't second-guess yourself a lot. You, you know, realize that not every situation is going to work out well, and so you're not hard on yourself. You don't tend to be perfectionistic and put yourself down. So your attitude is pretty optimistic, and you tend to pick relationships, friendships, and romantic relationships that bring out your best. So that at the end of the day, you feel pretty good, and you know, and you're basically valuing yourself and trusting your own judgment. Well, and you mentioned in your book um, that a, a lot of women are, um, you know, they're putting their partner first and they're making sacrifices to make their partner happy, which I think women do a lot anyway, you know, in a yeah. in a family unit, you know, the kids come first, the dog comes first, the partner comes first, and, and they're, they're barely even taking care of themselves because they're, they're doing all of this. And of course, what you're saying is, is that you're coming first even though you're in a relationship unit. And I think that exactly. can be hard for a lot of women to, to grasp. It's very hard because, you know, we're socialized, I know in America, and it's maybe true in, in Canada as well, to put other people before us. You know, we're kind of caretakers. We tend to be overly responsible. And it doesn't mean you're being selfish to put your needs first. If you care about yourself and you feel good about what you're doing, 
Let's say you decide to go back to school to get another degree or change careers. It's going to enhance your life in the long run. And as a result, the relationships that you have. I know when I went back to graduate school, it was one of the best things that I could do. But, it, you know, it took some time away from my family. In the long run, they saw that that was a good thing. So basically, being able to assert what's important to you can enhance your self-esteem and your quality of life. And, you know, it's not just daughters of divorce that tend to have that issue. You know, women in general tend to have lower self-esteem than men starting in adolescence. So that can lead to depression. That's why our rates of depression are higher than men. And we have, you know, we have the opportunity to work on that, as I said, you know, through counseling, through groups, through a lot of different mechanisms and um, get support from other people and realize we're not alone. Well, I think that's important as well. We often feel really isolated in this. And, and with what you're seeing in your book, it's actually um, not something that we're isolated with because it's, it's common experiences for, for women who are daughters of divorce. For, for women overall, but certainly when you were raised in a family with a lot of chaos, you know, maybe some loss and different situations, sometimes people move a lot too when their families. Divorce, so you maybe didn't have always the opportunity to have a lot of stability. So, you know, by working on your self-esteem and setting your own goals, and like I said, start simple. Like these are some things that I'm going to do. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to take a 30-minute walk every day. You know, I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to develop hobbies and interests. You know, you're, you're going to attract people that are also feeling better about themselves. So it's just kind of making a stand for yourself and not, you know, um, being stuck and worrying about having to take care of other people all the time. Because sometimes in divorced families, it was true in my family, Rebecca, I spent a lot of time worrying about my parents, especially my mom at times. And um, that wasn't always a good thing. As I grew older, I had to kind of back off from that a little bit and be a little more assertive about what my needs were. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, important and and hard to learn. Um, How can, you know, if we have that distrust that we spoke about earlier, how can we learn to repair that in our relationships? Well, if, like I said, when we're picking partners who are trustworthy, We have to determine how much of it is our own issue and how much of it is the other person. And you have to make a commitment to work on it and to not overreact or blow things out of proportion. If you're pretty sure that the person is someone you can trust, if they are faithful, if they're reliable, if they seem to have your best interests at heart, you have to... Slow yourself down and really examine your own thoughts. On the other hand, some relationships really bring out mistrust. Let me give you an example. I talked to one woman who, whenever she told her partner that she didn't trust him, he would get really angry at her, and they would argue and it would make things worse. So I recommend if you have trust issues to pick a partner who is empathetic, understands that, and be upfront about it, be vulnerable. And then if you have those feelings of mistrust, be able to talk to them about it. Because the way to get over the trust issues after you examine how much of it is your own stuff is to have a partner who reassures you. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Because if your partner automatically gets upset with you and says, oh, you just don't trust anyone, that's your own issue, and makes you feel feel worse, that's not really going to help you work through it. So you have to have a partner who's willing to go, you know, the extra mile with you and say, okay, I, I get it, you have trust issues. 
I'm going to call you, for instance, you know, when I'm running a little late. I'm going to reassure you instead of making you feel like, oh, this is a big problem. So who you pick as a partner can definitely help you work through the trust issues. Well, I think that's important to know when we're looking at this because we talked about how we can um, pick the wrong partners because of our past. And uh-huh. so even if we're trying to make it work, it, it takes two people. So there is that aspect to it as well, even when we're mm-hmm. working on ourselves. Pick a partner who, you know, is, is reassuring, loving, has your best interest at heart. And then when they do make mistakes, as we all do, then accept that and try to move beyond it and not hold on to it. Realize not all, not all mistakes are intentional and we're all human. Mm-hmm. It's just important as well. It's a tricky balance, I think, when you're trying to... Yeah, it is. Trying to... like a tightrope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Walking <laughs> on a tightrope. <laughs> Exactly. Um, especially when you said 69% of, of conflicts can be resolved. So we have to find which ones of those can be and then find that line. Exactly. I used to think for a long time before I started reading Dr. Gottman's books, which I highly recommend, oh, I've got to work through all these conflicts and, you know, every, every issue has to be resolved. It was very reassuring for me to realize, okay, it's kind of like learning to live and accept that not everything's going to be resolved, but hopefully it can be managed. Okay. You know, you're not going to be um, unhappy and getting a divorce if you don't work through everything, but just, you know, try to find ways to listen to your partner's side of the story and accept, okay, we're not going to resolve this one. You're going to see things differently than me, and I can live with that. Yeah, which I think is important. Um, So you spoke earlier about being vulnerable with your partner. What does that mean? Being vulnerable is so key to a healthy, trusting relationship. And basically what that is, Rebecca, is being comfortable, being open and honest about your thoughts and your feelings and your wishes without worry about ramifications. Do you remember earlier when I said a lot of daughters of divorce kind of are waiting for that other shoe to drop? And they're kind of nervous in a way that their relationships aren't going to last. So because of that, sometimes it creates a feeling of being overly cautious and not being comfortable being authentic and sharing who you are. I know that feeling well, and many women that I've talked to have had that feeling of just feeling kind of closed off emotionally, shut down. And so being vulnerable is like the opposite of that. It's being who you are without worrying too much about what the other person's going to think. It's not about being inconsiderate or being unthoughtful, but it's just being who you really were meant to be. Which I think is is, uh, what you're supposed to do, so I don't think that's being inconsiderate at all. No. No. So, um, Terry, this has been a really great show, and I, I think there's so much more in your book than we were able to talk about in an hour. So is there a way that people can get more information or get a hold of you? Yes, I have a website, which you can log on to um, by Googling movingpastdivorce.com. That's Moving past divorce.com and on the website Rebecca we have free blogs that you can read and you can write comments and we'll write comments back I also have a Facebook page with the same name where I post articles and you know not only that I write that other but ones from other people and then I have I'm active on Twitter move past divorce on Twitter And I write for a lot of other websites as well. I've been fortunate to write for Huffington Post on a regular basis, divorcedmoms.com, and just recently but was had the honor of being um, asked to write for the Gottman Institute, which is um, run by Dr. John Gottman, who I mentioned. So I do as many 
appearances as I can, but I love the website um, and the Facebook and the Twitter pages because that, there I get a lot of interaction with people, and I'm always happy to answer questions. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And everybody, make sure that you have a, a safe and happy holidays, and I'll speak to you again in the new year. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.